Welcome to the SEC Audiology Event Webinar Series. My name is Michelle Jackson, and I am SEC's Manager of Professional Development. Today is the third webinar in our series, and we are happy to have you here. Thank you very much to BMS, who has graciously sponsored this webinar. BMS is SAC's trusted broker for our member liability insurance program. For more than eight years, SAC has worked with BMS to provide our members with comprehensive professional liability coverage and access to specialized brokers and legal services. For more information or to connect with BMS, please visit sac.bmsgroup.com. I want to acknowledge that the SAC offices are located in downtown Ottawa, Canada, occupying the unceded traditional land of the Algonquin and Nishnabeg people. At the bottom of your screen, you will have access to a few options. Submit your questions for the presenter in the Q&A box and use the chat to send questions to SAC staff, which is me. Now it's time to start our presentation. <coughs> Please join me in welcoming our presenter, Jeremy Voix. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Michel. Thank you uh, all for being here. Thank you for the organizer for having me uh, with you remotely. My name is uh, Jeremy Voix. I'm a full professor at the Ecole de Technologie Supérieure in Montreal. And I'm thrilled to share a little bit about the future of in-ear technologies and hearables. And um, I'm actually uh, leading a research group that we called an industrial research chair in in-ear technologies. And it's funded half by the NSERC, the National Science and Engineering Research Council, and half by a private uh, Canadian company called EARS, EARS Technologies. And um, together, we do have uh, students and researchers working on the future of uh, hearables. And just to mention that I'm at, at arm's length uh, with ears, being uh, fully a professor uh, full-time uh, at Ecole de Technologie Superior. So now, uh, before we looked uh, really into the uh, future, I would say, of uh, those in-ear devices and hearable technologies, I'd like as well to cover some elements from the past that may be of uh, relevance uh, for many of you. So let's go a little bit um, back in the days and let's compare a little bit the situations that we had, let's say a couple of decades away and uh, nowadays. So maybe you have that feeling that a lot of things have evolved. You know, cars are no longer what they used to be 30 years ago or 40 years ago. Same thing for cell phones, uh, cellular communications, but uh, you do have some products. Uh, this is the classic uh, earplug that you did not change. You know, over that time frame, they are still used, they were used, they are still used. So you may be, you know, thinking that not many things did change over time in hearing protection. And I will uh, show you a little bit indeed where we came from and what has changed over those uh, couple of decades. So let's go back really to the, the past and really the legacy. You know, how do we protect uh, hearing? I think in this community, we care about uh, hearing. We understand how valuable that sense is for the human experience and how fragile it is too. So we do have to uh, protect hearing. This is definitely something that we have to do. And as a trained engineer and acoustician, I know that I have to reduce first uh, the level of machinery and reduce the exposure, noise control at the source, as we say. But sometimes we do have to rely on hearing protectors. So hearing protectors, um, they, are not they are not necessarily uh, uh, new to you. You recognize, uh, starting on the upper left, uh, those foam plugs I just mentioned in the introductions. So they are really those uh, devices that you have to uh, basically roll down in order to get a fit. So that's the one of the trick that may be a little bit complicated for uh, people in the field is actually to get a proper fit of those uh, foam plugs. And this is by really having a very, very thin uh, shallow cylinder that you will insert deeply in the ear canal. You have then what we call pre-molded ear plugs. So those pre-molded, they can last longer. They can be reusable for a couple of weeks at least. And um, then you have something which is a hybrid that is a little bit more recent that we call the push to fit foam. So this is the idea that you combine the good attenuation that you can achieve with a deeply fitted foam plug with the convenience of having a stem, something you can grab on and you can push inside the ear. 
So those, those push to fit forms are quite, you know, of interest and they you know, came a little bit later on the market as well. If we look at the second line, we do have custom, custom ear plugs uh, for our start. So this is how um, you do obtain your ear impression and do from that ear impression, uh, manufacture a passive uh, attenuation uh, device. So that can be a solid ear plug. You know that sometimes they can be filtered. You can have some little leaks, basically, acoustical leakage that are controlled leakage and that lets more or less uh, sound get through. You even have uh, some filters that are supposed to be a little bit flatter in terms of attenuation. Uh, for example, the musician's earpiece by uh, Etymetic Research. You do as well have uh, basic uh, electronic features. Uh, think of um, gun, um, gunshot uh, earplug, which uh, will really compress all the noise that are above a given level and protect you from the, the blast of your firearm while leaving you um, with natural transparency hearing for the rest of the time. And uh, then another category that came up as well, a little bit more recently on the market, that we call the semi inserts. So they are a little bit of a an arch uh, using the um, a little bit of the uh, borrowing from the earmuff, except that those are uh, really earplugs on top of uh, branches and um, headbands. And finally, on the lower side, you do have earmuffs. So you know them, they can be uh, mounted on hot hats, they can be uh, featuring some communication capabilities. Uh, here, a boom mic that you see in the middle uh, low screen. Uh, low, just exactly like I do have here, boom mic picking up my voice. And that's a little bit of the, uh, of the uh, situation for now. So unfortunately, there are issues with those hearing protectors. And I will ask Michel to kindly uh, launch maybe our first um, <coughs> survey or um, uh, questionnaire. And that questionnaire is, what are really the issues that are, that are associated with those uh, traditional hearing protectors? And here you can uh, hopefully pick more than one. Um, and in 10 seconds, We'll see how you feel about the issues of all the hearing protectors I just showed you. Well, so I realize here this is uh, one choice only, so pick your best. And let's see if we can share the results from that instant feedback. I know some of you have a experience so this is a good spread between uh, the three answers <clears throat> unfortunately you couldn't uh, pick the three of them but actually my take is uh, that the uh, all those hearing protectors uh, do lack uh, comfort and that's both the physical comfort and uh, the perceptual comfort perceptual comfort that's the idea that you can hear uh, noise through uh, the uh, the protector and hear what's what's important for you. So think of uh, warning signals, voice, uh, and the like. And the second big uh, issue, so lack of comfort, that's physical and uh, perceptual. And the uh, third item would be really the fact that we don't know if you are actually protected or not from those devices. You know, in the traditional uh, experience, we have absolutely no idea to know: Are you really getting uh, protection from that foam plug that you just fitted, and if so, how much protection, and is that sufficient for your exposure? So that's problematic um, because the lack of comfort and obviously uh, leads to some uh, removal. If this is uncomfortable, what you will see in the field, and many of you may have this experience, is that people will tend to say, well, you know, I'm wearing them when it's really noisy, and then, you know, over time it hurts, so I remove them by the end of the day, or every time I have, uh, you know, uh, this pain, I just don't wear them for a couple of days. So this is the kind of uh, issue you may run into, and that's really creating a, a problem in the uh, effectiveness of those devices. So here is a little bit of a technical graph, um, but I will go through uh, slowly through it. If you look on the X axis, you do have the time the hearing protector has not been worn. So you see that you can uh, not for, for the full shift that would be that you didn't wear it at all. So that's really at uh, 480 minutes. You didn't wear it for the whole day. So obviously you get zero dB attenuation. This is what you read on the Y axis. And let's say that you take that foam plug that has, let's say, a nominal attenuation of 30 dB. Well, if you were to wear it all time long, so meaning that you didn't remove it at all, so you're at zero uh, removal, you do get the benefit of the 30 dB. You see my arrow here. But what's really surprising is that as soon as you don't wear that device, and let's say you don't wear it just for a couple minutes, so let's say five minutes out of your uh, eight hours shift, you see that you reduce the 30 dB down to 20 dB. 
And if you remove it for 15 minutes, this is now 15 dB. I'm following the, green, the blue uh, dotted curve. So this me really means that if you want a human protector to be effective, you need to wear it for the continuous uh, exposure and the continuous time you are exposed to noise, which is obviously uh, defeating the, the problem that we do have with comfort. And you should not remove it, although it might be a discomfort on the long run. So to address the comfort issues, the idea is to design hearing protectors that are more and more comfortable. So here I'm just uh, probably showing uh, some artifacts uh, from a, a past initiative we had with a company called Sonomax in Montreal that was to design instant molded uh, custom earplugs. So the idea, and this is why I'm feeling free to, uh, to share it nowadays, is that it's no longer on the market, but it was a big splash when it was uh, released uh, in 2012. And the idea is that you'll be uh, having a custom ear impression that becomes a hearing protector in the field uh, instantly. And the process for that is that you have pumps that are mounted on the side of the head in this headband that will release a liquid silicone rubber that will fill a bladder inside a membrane, inside um, the ear. And so this is a, a shape that is inflating. And once this is inflated and cured, you can remove it and you have a solid uh, ear impression. And so you have a custom ear protection device in three minutes. And that was really something that was uh, developed here in Canada that was, you know, an uh, interesting paradigm of how can we do mass customization. So a um, custom product, but for the masses. So <clears throat> let's move to our second uh, issue, the issue of uh, unknown attenuation. And that's something that is uh, really um, documented in the, um, in the studies in the field. And this is here uh, a summary we did with uh, with Elliot Berger on all the um, all the studies that have been out in Europe, uh, North America on field values of hearing protection devices. How do their real world performance? So RW stands for real world. And let's look at the first uh, bar graph on the left, and you see the labeled value of uh, rolled on forms. So this is really that kind of uh, foam plug. And you see in the lab, 30 dB or 29 dB, they perform very well when they are in a controlled environment fitted on test subjects under ideal condition. But in the field, this is very different. You know, I mentioned that roll down uh, gym, little uh, uh, gymnastic that you have to do. Uh, a lot of factors are actually affecting the way you will fit those foam plugs, those roll down foam plugs. And in practice, people in the field, and this is coming from more than 40 uh, cross studies, uh, get in average at 98%, so that's the 98th percentile, uh, they get less than 5 dB. So you see theory 29, practice 5 dB. So that's a huge <clears throat> shift. We call that sometimes a derating. There are derating rules that have been around for a little while. And that's really the problem that you do see. And you do see that for all types of hearing protection devices. You see on my graph, you have the roll down, the pre molded the custom, the semi insert, and the EMF, same story. Maybe the EMF, if you look at the right uh, plot, are slightly better because you don't have such a huge discrepancy, but still, hearing protection devices do not perform the same in the field as they do in the lab under ideal condition. So to address that, and that was really the beginning of my, my PhD back, uh, let's say, um, well, 20 years ago, <laughs> um, and the idea was really, well, can we really measure the attention that somebody is getting, our user is getting in the real world? And for that, uh, the idea was very simple. Let's put some microphones in and outside. So here you can see what we call the microphone doublet. So an inside mic that is uh, picking up the sound through the hearing protection device. So under uh, the occluded ear, uh, ear canal, and an external uh, microphone that is picking up the ambient noise. And this uh, system has been later uh, adapted um, by uh, a company that you may know that is called the 3M, and this is what they call the 3M ear fit uh, dual ear radiation system. And you see that we have that same microphone system with a speaker on the outside to produce that noise and measure across the earplug the attenuation. So it's really Again, the speaker on the outside that produce some broadband noise, and you have that microphone doublet I mentioned that is picking up outside and inside through the earplug. And so you can really ask the user to fit the device and have really what we call a personal attention rating, so really an attention on uh, that user for that exact product. So that uh, technology is not unique on the market. You will see that there are now uh, a couple uh, systems that have been uh, released. They are called uh, fit test uh, systems. And they are really there to give individual uh, estimation of the attention achieved uh, by workers. 
And actually, you have more than uh, you know two or three that are illustrated. We do have actually a full uh, table, and so this is probably uh, you know uh, close to twenty uh, systems that do exist currently in the field that are used for fit testing of hearing protection devices. And so that was such you know a change of paradigm in hearing perception programs that it actually had some you know influence on a lot of uh, material. So if you look first um, at what is used by the uh, KEOC. So occupational uh, people um, in the United States, the noise manual will be released, <coughs> excuse me, and has a special edition of a complete chapter on uh, fit testing. You do as well have a, a new, <coughs> let me just clear my. Sorry, uh, you do as well have a new uh, American national standard called the NCS 12.71 that has been released just in 2018. That is about how we would estimate the, the performance of those various fit test systems I just uh, showed you, the 20 that were in the tables, and how can we define what we call uncertainty measurements. So how can we be sure that when they give a par, personal notation rating, this is a value I can trust. And finally, in Canada, we are not, um, we are quite on top of things too. You know, since 2014, we do have in chapter 13 a little um, uh, text addressing those fit testing systems. And we are currently working on the Z, uh, Z1007 on uh, including fit testings as part of the uh, Canadian Standard Association uh, material. So that's a little bit uh, the overview uh, of uh, you know, what has been passed. And now if we look at uh, the present situation, well, you can imagine that we can really uh, build from uh, those uh, various uh, elements I just mentioned. So I, you already used a couple of times uh, the idea uh, that we could have a, a hearable. And what is a hearable? Well, uh, to date, uh, a hearable is probably something that would be uh, merging hearing protection, monitoring, of the exposure and communication in noise, at least for what we call enterprise wearables, which are really you know in the field of uh, industrial um, of industry. So if I go um, inside the interconnection or intersection of those three domains, how do we protect? How do we uh, monitor the noise uh, exposure of the worker, and how do we enable that worker to communicate in noise? You remember to address the issues of uh, comfort, acoustical and perceptual comfort. Here is the, the hearable. So here I'll be just uh, sharing what we designed at uh, Critias, uh, the research chair, uh, and have been designing or working for the last 10 years on. And, but that will be giving you a good idea of what the hearable is and what it features in terms of, uh, of electronic. So if you look inside the uh, earpiece, you will see that double uh, loudspeaker here and a little microphone. So they are tubed in order to be uh, really uh, isolated. There is no crosstalk between the speaker and uh, the microphone inside the ear. We will have an external microphone as well that will be mounted on the faceplate uh, of the earpiece, sometimes with a windscreen. And here you see that the electronic will be mounted on that little uh, PCB, electronic circuit. And uh, there will be sometimes some, uh, we need some real estate to put the batteries, the DSP, the digital signal processor. Uh, in our case, we needed to have as well a wired connection. So you see here the connector to program uh, the system. So it looks a little bit like, uh, you know, a Bluetooth earpiece in such sort. And now you recognize the part that I just mentioned, which is that custom fitted, uh, instant custom fitted uh, technology that we inherited it from, uh, from Sonomax back in the days. So from with this kind of device, uh, this is you know currently what we do have in the uh, let's say in the lab to work on. You can combine hearing protection and you can think of uh, having instant uh, fit custom earpieces. You know that there are three D scanners coming around. We can you know get custom ear impression for comfort and attenuation. You know, uh, and that's becoming uh, more and more um, you know easy uh, every day. And the second thing that we would do uh, for the industrial workplace is really monitor the noise underneath the hearing protection device. So rather than just saying, OK, this is the attention you get, and uh, oh, that was the uh, noise exposure outside, we do directly measure inside the ear canal the level you're exposed to. And not only do we do that at the very precise location of the eardrum, but we do that as well continuously. And here you see even a proposal that we had for what we call 24 hours 
uh, dosimetry. And that's really the idea that that wearable device, that hearable, not only do you wear that for your work, and you can see your work shift uh, on the top axis, those two blocks, but you wear that during your commute time because you may be listening to some podcast. You wear that as well when you're going to the movies later on, you know, in the night, in the evening because that's loud out there and you want to protect your hearing. And so this is really something that you're us using uh, all day long. So now if you look at the middle graph, you see how the exposure will fluctuate uh, among those different activities. And hopefully during your lunch break and dinner, this is, you know, less, uh, noisy but they are different during your sleep too but there are definitely uh, a lot of time where you see the dose so really the cumulative energy that your ear is receiving which leads eventually to unfortunately some uh, noise induced hearing loss so if you look at the lower uh, graph you see the dose that is always uh, accumulated during the day and uh, where you recover uh, during the night because you're uh, in a very calm environment and that's the assumption of all hearing conservation practices and all uh, legislation on occupational um, exposure to noise. So in practice, uh, here's a, a mock-up of uh, something that has been uh, prototyped uh, by EARS, the company that is our partner in research. And you see indeed how for an individual worker, I would have those two lines, two traces. One is the outside level, one is the inside level, and there are a lot of corrections. It's uh, not as simple as putting the microphone. There are a lot of uh, tweaking and uh, calibration that you need to do. But at the end, <clears throat> you do have the answer of, well, how is my uh, workforce uh, protected? So, and you can see some people that have good power. Power, again, is the uh, protection, so the personal attention rating. And Eric Tremblay here uh, has a very good power and a very low dose, so that's all good. But Stephen Hamill did not succeed that well. So you can really do that individual, you know, counseling and approach. And we believe this is a, a big plus for uh, hearing, prevention, hearing loss prevention programs. <clears throat> so finally, we mentioned the uh, difficulty to uh, communicate in noise. You know that when it's noisy, it's very difficult to uh, hear somebody speaking to you, speci specifically if you do have hearing protectors and if you do have some uh, mild or moderate hearing loss, uh, the two will combine together and make those uh, voices very hard to pick up. Um, they will also make those warning signals uh, hard to, uh, to hear or to detect. And so here um, is an approach we developed that is really to let uh, at least the speech signal be, um, be communicated from one worker to the other worker. So here, the trick is that you remember that microphone that we had in the ear, it's used to measure the dose that is reaching the eardrum, the dose uh, in the occluded ear, but we can use it as well to uh, measure the, um, to actually pick up the voice of the wearer. So the idea is that well, currently I'm speaking and you see that my voice uh, is probably picked up by that boom microphone that I have here uh, dangling. But uh, you may realize that there is as well um, some because of the occlusion effect. So the fact that when we do occlude the ear, we hear ourselves uh, loud, uh, very boomy voice um, and quite loud. Um, we, if we occlude that ear but put the microphone in, then we will pick up uh, as well the voice. And the beauty of picking up the voice inside the occluded ear so you can see here the very first hardware we had uh, now six years ago uh, with a little bell pack that had all the processing and the earpiece that are equipped uh, just like the hearable I showed you. So there is a loudspeaker inside, a microphone inside and a microphone outside. And what we will do is we will pick up the voice that is that you're producing, but not from a mouth microphone or a boom microphone. We will pick up you know, from uh, inside the ear. And as I was saying, the beauty is that you do benefit from the fact that the ear was already occluded by the earplug. You see the custom earplug here. And you do get what we call a good signal to noise ratio. So here is a little demonstration that we had uh, where we will be playing uh, first the speech of that uh, person that is wearing. So that will be clean speech. And then I'll have you listen to the speech in the environment at the zero dB signal to noise ratio. The birch canoe slid on the smooth planks. Very clear, but not in the real world. The birch canoe slid on the smooth planks. Zero dB, you can hardly hear. Let's hear inside the ear. The birch canoe slid on the smooth planks. So you can hear the voice, but it's boomy and there is noise. So let's remove the noise. 
The birch canoe slid on the smooth plank. And it feels a little bit boomy, so let's try to enhance and recreate the high frequency. The birch canoe slid on the smooth plank. Not bad. Let's compare to the original when there was no noise. The birch canoe slid on the smooth plank. That's crystal clear, but let's look again. Let's hear again the result. The birch canoe slid on the smooth plank. We proved that it was at least, uh, sorry, we proved that it was um, as you know, intelligible as the original uh, signal. And this is really opening a new, um, you know, new product lines where you can really have people that are protected against the noise, uh, isolated you know, from their environment and from the toxic noise and still have a clear communication. And what's really funny is that when that <clears throat> product was launched, and I think you, you saw the company uh, in the prior slide, it was launched in Quebec and piloted in Quebec. And that was in a company that actually is using a lot of a face mask. And now you are all used to that uh, reality is that when we do have a face mask or a shield or something, you know, a respirator on your mouth, it's very hard to understand what's being said. But the beauty is that since the voice was picked up inside the ear, there was no uh, problem at keeping the mask on. And actually some workers said, well, it's great. You know, your product is not only protecting my hearing, but it's protecting my lungs because now I don't have to lift my hearing, my face mask or my respirator to speak to my colleague. I can just pick the normal way and your microphone will do the job. So that was quite funny to say, well, we protect your ears and your lungs from the ear canal. And so that uh, product that I, I referred to was actually um, uh, manufactured uh, in the pilot uh, stage by the partner company, Ears. And this is how it looked like uh, back a uh, couple of years back, and you can see uh, that was not actually custom earplugs that were used, but foam uh, plugs. But for the rest, that's exactly what I described with the uh, casings, with the speakers, microphone uh, for each ear. And then the, um, the uh, system that would be worn, let's say on the pocket, on the collar, or that would be clipped uh, somewhere. And I'm quite proud to say as well that uh, this technology actually uh, received the uh, first prize uh, in uh, a global competition that was launched by the Americans, uh, actually by the NIOSH OSHA uh, initiative back in 2016. So that's a little bit uh, dated now, but that was really, you know, something that uh, helped us a lot. Uh, we were just a lab and a small startup company out of Montreal. And, uh, you know, we made the big slash uh, with our uh, friends, uh, American friends, and got uh, from that time on uh, some traction. So you won't be surprised if you see a product, you know, uh, hitting the market very soon. Uh, it won't have exactly the same look as what you've seen because that, those were really the pre, uh, pre products. But, uh, you know, this is currently the state of uh, technology that we do have to protect workers, uh, help them communicate in noise, and get really uh, an idea of how much uh, they are protected or exposed uh, to noise. All right. So I've been uh, speaking fast here. So the, uh, we'll be now looking in a little bit uh, into the, uh, the future. And um, for that, I'd like to share a little bit of a, a roadmap. And I call that a technology uh, wheel. And it's uh, really something that I, um, you know, designed to illustrate uh, the very, uh, the large number of applications uh, you could have, you could have uh, in the ear. So this is a little bit futuristic. Uh, this part is really the ongoing research, but is being uh, worked on uh, as we speak. And um, I will maybe go um, clockwise uh, through all the possible uh, applications. And uh, so starting with the uh, very basic one, uh, symbol A, uh, really what you can do in the ear is protect. So the passive hearing protection that's, uh, that's here uh, for sure, that's here to stay. We need to protect, although we do reduce the noise of machinery and so on, we have that need. Element B would be the fit test. So you've seen a couple applications where we use those for example, two microphones, one inside, one outside. And from that, we can really assess on every uh, worker and every individual the effectiveness of the uh, hearing protectors. One thing that I mentioned as well is the uh, in-ear dosimetry. So you can really measure inside the ear uh, the level that reached uh, the eardrum and that passed through the hearing protection device and have really uh, an idea of uh, how much the worker is exposed to. And uh, one thing I just uh, mentioned here between parentheses is that, as I said, there is a lot of corrections and calibrations to be done on that microphone. You know that all the uh, standards uh, do use what we call the free field equivalent sound pressure level. So this is really the, the level at which a worker 
is exposed, but the measurement is done at the center of the head without the, the person in place. So it really means that we have to do a correlation between what is that free field equivalent and what is the in-ear uh, microphone level. So that's something that is uh, you know, a very important part of the research uh, we did for the in-ear dosimetry. Element D is the uh, sound reproduction. You know, producing sound inside the ear canal is not the same as producing that over loudspeakers. Again, there are some uh, corrections to be made. The PINA effect, uh, the ear canal resonance, all these uh, changes and alters the way you perceive sound. So there is a lot of equalization, EQ, to be, to be done. And there is also that, you know, uh, a lot of uh, psychoacoustical uh, factors. Uh, some people relate to them as uh, the missing 6 dB or other abnormalities that we notice when we reproduce sound inside the ear. So that's another area of research. <clears throat> In element E, we do have the um, idea that we could use the external microphone and filter uh, sounds that are reaching the employee, the worker, and just let the useful signal get through. So this is like denoising. You do have that in, uh, in hearing aids, for example, you denoise uh, the environment to just let speech get through. Well, this is something that we can do, borrowing from those uh, hearing aid techniques or from uh, radio communication systems as well. Um, one thing that you may have questions uh, on, and you're welcome, if you see, to use the Q&A section for those, is, well, what about those active noise controls? You know that there, is, there are ways now, nowadays to generate anti-noise. So it means that if you have a surrounding incoming wave, you can generate with a speaker an anti-wave that will actually null or cancel uh, that sound pressure level instantly at the eardrum. And you have some products that you may have seen that are very, very uh, powerful or very uh, very in interesting. If you're taking, uh, you're on a flight and uh, you put them on, suddenly the airplane noise is uh, completely uh, diminished and you can still hear some voice over and so on. So it's interesting feature. This is obviously uh, coming now to the earplug. It used to be really for earmuffs and now for earplugs, you can have the same uh, type of technologies and you may have seen actually products on the market being tested uh, for what we call active noise control uh, earplugs. Element G would be the fact that, well, in the ear, you can do uh, some hearing tests. So uh, a lot of you are familiar with what we call autoacoustic emissions. So this is the idea that by stimulating uh, the well, cochlea uh, through, for example, uh, pure tones in the, in the paradigm that is called the uh, distortion product, you're sending two tones, F1 and F2 frequencies. And those two tones will be uh, amplified by the outer hair cells of the cochlea. And this amplification will create what we call um, uh, intermodulation distortion, which is called a distortion product in the audiology field, which is uh, played back or actually pickable by the in-ear microphone. So you can hear that the ear is responding with a third frequency that we call F3, which is exactly a 2F1 minus F, uh, F2. And so you know where to expect that very, very faint signal. And then you can extract that signal and get an idea of, well, is the peripheral uh, ear uh, functioning? So you know that this is a test that is used for newborn uh, screening, where you can have people uh, test if on a newborn that cannot raise hands uh, to say that uh, he, heard, uh, he or she heard some tones, but you can at least uh, test that, yes, indeed, those uh, peripheral systems are uh, apparently working. So that's something that we were able to move into a commercial product, or at least an industrial product, uh, for early tests. And you can have employees that are uh, monitored for their autoacoustic emissions throughout the day. And you understand that not only are they, uh, do you measure the noise they have been exposed to, but you measure as well how the ear is responding. So having that exposure and response, those response, you do have individual relationship um, and individual um, susceptibility to noise induced hearing loss. So those are really the uh, the, the elements uh, that we are working on the hearing protection uh, side. Now I'm looking at the uh, lower uh, H and I, what uh, are really the communication in noise. So the uh, hearing aid, we'll discuss that in a couple of minutes, but you understand that uh, hearing aid, which is basically just an amplifier, you take the external microphone and you boost uh, the frequencies with some compression and the like. Uh, this is something that is obviously achievable uh, for any hearable. 
you uh, saw as well the speech capture. I gave you a little demonstration of how the voice can be picked up inside the ear and can be uh, transferred, for example, over radio or can be recorded or can be used for any purposes. So let's move to another uh, quadrant that I find quite interesting that I call the biosensing. And the biosensing will start with the idea that we can measure some biosignals uh, inside the ear canal. So we can pick up a lot of uh, sounds that are coming from your body and that are more or less meaningful. But you know, I can hear, I will sh uh, show you what I, I can pick up with a microphone, but uh, bear with me, I can pick up uh, much more uh, than simply those noises. And basically I hear everything. I hear you digest, I hear you muscle activity. I hear a lot of information. Uh, you know, even some clicks of your of your eyes just from a microphone placed in, inside the ear canal. We'll uh, we'll show you a, a little uh, graph on that. Uh, K, that's the idea that in the ear canal you do have access already to uh, very uh, basic physiological information. But temperature is one. You know that you can sense the temperature uh, from from there and any fever. Uh, there are applications actually to assess, uh, you know, fertility cycles for women just by monitoring that temperature, the original method, but that has been now ported on a, on a hearable uh, technology. Uh, you can me measure as well the humidity, and that can be useful if you're monitoring remotely some workers. So think of a, a miner in, you know, uh, working really, uh, really deep, and uh, for deep mining applications, you want to see that that person is fine, is not suffering from overheat and the like, and that's something you can do already in the ear. Just like you can monitor uh, with L, you can monitor all the dynamic uh, head movement. So is that worker moving? Uh, we actually uh, just uh, released an application where we can detect fall, and fall is very important in the industry. You want to detect uh, a man down situation. Uh, that's very important, especially for remote workers. And uh, we have the beauty of having uh, sensors that are really, really robust because it's no longer uh, something that you wear on the body, on the chest, like firefighters would have. This is something that is in the ear. And guess what? You have two ears. And having two ears, you can have some redundancy because they always move together. There is very few times where one ear moves one way and the other the, or the other. They are always you know, solid uh, on the head, which means that you have some redundancy and you can have with a very inexpensive sensor, a very good uh, quality in terms of measurements and uh, robustness. And finally, uh, element M is the physiological sensing. So this is the fact that you can sense a lot of uh, information from uh, inside the ear. Uh, one of them is, for example, a demo we did uh, where you can sense um, what we call non-verbal information. So here you heard me uh, since the beginning, and I'm sorry for that, <clears throat> but really having to clear my throat a lot of times, and this is indeed because I'm stressed uh, by this presentation. I want to keep, you know, uh, keep, keep up with time, uh, have time to uh, answer your questions. And so <clears throat> this is information that you pick up that is, and just clearing my throat again, as saliva noise, you hear all that. And for you, this tells you something. As human beings, you know, well, this presenter is a little bit stressed. And you know, currently for a machine, um, this is not necessarily something they would use. The machine and the uh, transcription of that uh, lecture would be done, you know, with my broken English would be done, and hopefully the system will recognize my words, but not the emotions or really the mood I was in. And with this idea of monitoring, you know, those nonverbal events, uh, we can have uh, more information and convey those information, for example, to the machine. And that's a little bit of the uh, area we are uh, currently exploring. And finally, N uh, is the uh, idea that uh, the ear canal is distorting as we speak. So if you are not sure of that, uh, take your little finger, your pinky, and put it inside the ear uh, canal entrance and open and close your jaws. And you will feel that there is indeed uh, something happening. The ear canal is distorted as we speak, as we move our jaws, as we chew. And this is something that is uh, very interesting because guess what? Uh, you can, for example, recognize sometimes some facial expressions, somebody smiling, and this is already a different uh, position in the air canal. And there are some applications where we can recognize face facial expressions just from that air canal uh, deformations. And uh, biosensing ends with the holy grail, which is uh, EEG. So electrophysiology is the idea that you can sense uh, brain waves, uh, not only on the skull, but indeed inside the air canal. And I'll show you that in a, in a minute. 
So that's the biosensing. So you see that the ear canal is a very good place for all those biometrics. You can do a lot of uh, applications, a lot of sensing, uh, you know, from inside the ear canal. And this is completely discrete because that's the same form of factor we showed. So it may be looking like, you know, um, a Bluetooth uh, device, but it, you see that there could be much more than just a communication or protection. So this is just to give you an idea. The uh, last or one before last uh, aspect is what I call the stimulation. And so there is uh, the you know, ability to stimulate uh, through the ear canal. And if you go to uh, Chinese um, medicine, uh, traditional Chinese medicine and acupuncture, you will see that there are many, many meridians that are used uh, to stimulate some parts of your body through the ear. And some people claim that they can do the same using electrical stimulation. So if you had little electrodes and do what we call uh, direct current stimulation, you could induce uh, some uh, restoration. And if you're familiar with what we call vocal nerve stimulation, that's uh, the vocal nerve being very close to the, um, to the air canal medus, you can uh, probably uh, reach uh, to that nerve and really from, from a place that is very discreet, you don't have to be on the neck or any visible part of the body, you can be inside the ear and doing uh, some stimulation there. So this is another area really uh, uh, exploratory, but that is, uh, I think, interesting. Another one will be that you can stimulate with light and I'll keep you a little slide on that. And finally, you can stimulate with uh, mechanical excitation. That's a little bit closer to what I was saying, but as well that you can shake basically the ear and some of you are familiar with those uh, body and shores and the, the fact that you can stimulate the cochlea through bond conduction, just like Beethoven was, you know, hearing his uh, piano. And uh, that's uh, something that is uh, very possible. So you see that there is a lot. And there's a last one that I call the energy harvesting that will, call, uh, that will uh, keep for last. So let's go a little bit uh, through, the, um, through those in details. I just give you an overview. I will just highlight uh, a couple ones uh, where we had uh, recent successes. Um, but there, there are much more and I, I don't have time to cover everything we are, you know, exploring uh, in the team or with colleagues. Um, so I don't go back to those uh, ABC that are really hearing protection, uh, fit test and in-ear dosimetry. But I would go uh, to another one that I think is really a, a game changer. And this is uh, what we call uh, hearing aids. So, you know, hearing aids, but what you may not have uh, realized is that there was in 2017, um, an act uh, passed at the US Congress. And this is maybe uh, the only you know, positive uh, you know, legacy from that, uh, from that presidency. And it's probably backing, you know, originating from before that uh, presidency, but it's uh, you know, a, a deregulation uh, act, which is quite of interesting because it enables over the counter hearing aid act, uh, over the counter hearing aid to be, uh, to be sold over the counter. Basically, uh, meaning that a lot of those in-ear devices could be uh, hearing aids and making them uh, much cheaper than they are currently are. So uh, hearing aids, uh, I guess you're familiar, they look you know, a little bit like this, or they used to look uh, like this uh, quite often, which is not the most uh, sexy form. And it's very feasible uh, that in near future, uh, your next uh, hearing aid may look like this. And actually on purpose, I kept that slide because this is uh, when I was seeing that product coming out and I was, well, you know, this is exactly the electronic unit for a hearing aid. I wouldn't be surprised that a, a hearing aid would be made out of this, uh, out of those, uh, those, um, uh, sorry, um, earphones. And, um, and basically, uh, this is what happened. So if you look just at the last uh, iOS 14 that was released in September uh, 2021, 2020, sorry, uh, you will see that indeed you can use those uh, products with your audiogram and actually tune them for your hearing. And so this is the beginning, I think, of a new era. That company and other companies as well in the field are really prepared now to see that new market that is coming up. Uh, the fact that you can have any of those consumers' products becoming your hearing assistant or hearing aid and no longer uh, just a personal sound amplification uh, system piece up. And so that's coming up. And, you know, personally, I think that one of the big, you know, merit of that technology is the fact uh, that it really, uh, you know, enabled anybody to put anything inside the ear. So this is my attempt with a, a toothbrush uh, on the right. 
And you can see that it looks really, uh, you know, legit. And I could actually be wearing this uh, in the metro. I, I, I did that a couple of days in a row. Nobody really pays attention. This is all cool. This is what, what exactly that brand is that. But you can put anything in the ear <clears throat> and you no longer have the stigma associated with wearing a hearing aid, which I think is a very good uh, sign and a plus uh, for the upcoming years and for uh, having putting really hearing on the map. So another um, uh, application I just mentioned is the uh, bio signals measurements. So here I would ask uh, Michel to maybe uh, launch the second uh, pool or survey. And I will ask you uh, to identify what uh, the graph that you have behind uh, and what we call the spectrogram is. So if you look at the uh, this uh, figure, I don't know if you can see that with the poll, but if you have uh, the if you look at the spectrogram, this is the noise that we record inside uh, the ear. And my question to you, and this is just about reading the graph, is what are those little dots that we see, um, that we see almost at a zero, deep, zero hertz uh, frequency that are there almost every, uh, every second or a little bit more than one per second? And the answer would be, let's see if you, That's it. So 82% of you are right. This is indeed the heartbeat sounds. So what you see on that uh, spectrogram is really the raw uh, signal that is picked up inside the ear. And that came up as a surprise. You know, the very first time we were doing some measurements and that was really uh, a decade ago, but we noticed, well, there is something that is popping up. What is that? And we realized that indeed those black marks that I'm following with my uh, cursor here are really the heartbeat sounds. So this is really low frequency, but that we hear very clearly. And guess what? Nowadays, uh, what we call machine learning systems, uh, artificial intelligence, there are really systems that can pick up you know, those kinds of uh, signals from a very uh, noisy signal and extract them uh, to a good uh, and reliable uh, level. So indeed, I can hear the heartbeats just having a microphone inside your ear your ear and i don't need you know any expensive device any wearable that is sensing extra sensor and so on it's already there acoustically present not only that but i can hear in air and exhale uh, from your breathing rate and you can see here the very clear uh, lines that are just across frequency breaks between inhale and exhale and this is really uh, something that would enable me to extract uh, your breathing rate as well for free with just one microphone inside the ear and what you see on the top graph is that it's indeed well created uh, with biosensor that we can put uh, here. That was what we call the bio harness, uh, which is um, you know really picking up um, EKG uh, signals on the chest. And you can see that there's a good uh, time correlation between what we get in sound and what we get on the electrical uh, muscle uh, activity. Um, so you know one of the applications we're currently looking into. Um, is assessing what we call the heart rate variability. So you know that uh, the stress level will change how your heart rate, uh, the pace of your heart beats. And that uh, pacing variability, if you analyze that in time and frequency, give you an idea of how much a stress, arousal, or whatever uh, you're under. And this is something that we believe could be very helpful. With just one microphone, I can assess basically almost emotions uh, inside the ear. All right. So <clears throat> let's uh, move to um, one that I wanted to, uh, to present as well, which is uh, what we call the electrophysiology. So electrophysiology, uh, EEG, uh, electroencephalography uh, is something that you're all familiar with. And this is a very old technique. You see the very first EEG being uh, recorded here uh, <laughs> more than a century ago. And uh, the trend is currently that you are moving that EEG out of uh, the hospital or clinical environment inside the field. So if you look uh, at what we call the portable devices. Here are a couple of EEG um, headsets that are available on the market. And so you collect all those brain waves 
in a quite light and agile way. So you can be monitoring people uh, doing their activity that's very used uh, in laboratory environment, in light environment, uh, and that can be even uh, moved to a backpack. You can see that on the upper right, uh, colleagues at Oldenburg University in Germany that did that and record, um, you know, EEG as you go into social interactions and so on. So the benefits of EEG are known and you're certainly, um, some of you are experts in that field for the audiology part. And what's interesting is that if you're measuring uh, signals closer to the ear canal, you do get information that can be indeed mapped to a full scalp EEG uh, system to some extent, but you do as well have a lot of information that are uh, auditory evoked. So some of you are familiar with auditory evoked potentials, and this is the type of uh, device that we came up with, which is basically an EEG earpiece. Um, so you see, you recognize maybe the uh, earpiece shape from uh, the animation we had a couple of minutes ago. And so here we have electrodes that will be on the earpiece. So inside the ear, you have two electrodes inside the ear and you have three electrodes on the banana. So behind the ear really uh, on the, the mastoid. And um, here we benchmark that uh, system with a light density, a low density uh, EEG um, uh, uh, scalp. And uh, hat, sorry, and then uh, got, for example, some uh, some results we published on um, auditory evoked potential. I mentioned so here we have um, on the left side uh, reference that are in the conca, and on the right side the CZ uh, reference, and you can see here uh, some mismatch negativity and some P300 uh, that have been monitored. And what's interesting is that you do get indeed the very same you know, signals or same uh, signal magnitude uh, from those in-ear measurements as you would do uh, with uh, regular electrodes for those auditory uh, paradigm. And so there are a lot of uh, you know, uh, hope in this area. And I will just uh, branch that to the hearing aid. And you know that uh, one of the difficulty with a hearing aid is well, you know, you can filter, uh, we said, we can filter the uh, the noise and just let the speech get through. So you remove the noise. But if you have more than one speech uh, stream, so a couple of people speaking, you know, cocktail party, which stream would you uh, pick up and would you amplify? And for that, uh, the, the, the take is that you really have to ask the brain, you know, or the auditory cortex, what are you putting your attention on? which streams are you listening to? Is that uh, your grandchildren in front of you or is that your neighbor uh, on, 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 your, on your right or on your left? And you know, having that information and being able to tap into the efferent system, so really what's driving those uh, auditory system is uh, the holy grail. And you may have heard of what we call the cognitive control of hearing aid. So really having hearing aids that can be controlled by the, uh, by the brain. And uh, we believe that for that, you need a interface and that interface is indeed the ear or the earpiece. And this EEG earpiece is certainly one of the, of the you know, missing pieces uh, as we speak uh, to make this technology um, reach the, the real world. Uh, so that's, uh, that's a little bit of the future. And so I will just end with uh, one uh, application that I saved, which um, is I think quite funny is the fact that you can indeed uh, stimulate with light uh, the ear canal. And this has been not obvious because um, and still exists. And so you have that company that uh, launched a product that is just uh, LEDs, very bright uh, white LED with a full uh, spectrum uh, of a sun. And you put those earpieces in and uh, they claim, the company claim that indeed this is, uh, you know, helping for a lot of your uh, seasonal mood disorders, that, uh, jet lags, all the serot uh, serotonin and melatonin secretion that you do have related to the fact that you're exposed to, uh, to the sun. And so that was a little bit crazy at first, but then they came up with some, uh, some strong evidence. And here is, for example, uh, the recovery time it gets, uh, you, you need uh, to come back from a jet lag, if I remember well. And so you would see that uh, indeed you have uh, really reduced uh, annoyance, the VAS. Uh, so the annoyance or your, you know, all your effects are your, uh, let's say, jet lagged uh, effect is decreasing much faster starting at day three using uh, this uh, trans transcranial bright light as opposed to using just a placebo uh, system. So you can see that with a, you know, a good statistical difference between the two uh, trials. So, which is interesting and completely unexpected. How is that possible that there are some sensors 
uh, or cells that are uh, sensible to light inside the, uh, the ear. And it's actually not inside the ear, it's past the bone of the skull, and it's underneath that you have some photosensible uh, 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 synapses that are doing uh, that connection. So completely unexpected and you know, intriguing, I thought. All right, and so finally, this is a little bit of the, you know, the, uh, uh, you know, another of those, uh, those uh, we call them Friday uh, pet projects. And that was the idea that, uh, you know, I mentioned that there is a lot of uh, deformation in the air canal. And this is usually annoying for a lot of you. This is what will be breaking the seal of a hearing aid. This is what will be breaking the seal of a, a hearing protection device. But for us, we said, well, maybe there is something here uh, to be used. If by moving uh, the jaw uh, during my you know, daily activities, I'm distorting that ear canal, maybe I could use that uh, what we call jaw joint movement or toporal modular uh, joint movement to generate some electricity and to generate some energy because we will need energy for all those wearables and hearables I mentioned. And you know, uh, battery buttons are not necessarily the, the, the answer. And if you have a rechargeable battery, it's fine, but you need to extend you know, their, their duration. So what about recharging with uh, exactly the energy that is available in the ear? So we looked at all the possible sources of energy, the heat, uh, the uh, head movements, uh, the radio frequencies, the light, the wind, but we thought that that jaw movement was interesting. And so we designed that uh, uh, very first experiments back in the days where we had that uh, earplug that you've seen, the expandable earplug. Now it's filled with water and the water is actually moving a magnet inside the coil. So you generate electricity every time you have a flow of water in and out. And by uh, having this, you're uh, indeed measuring over the course of uh, 16 seconds, you're measuring all the opening and closing of the jaw. And you are here charging a little uh, capacitive element, so a little uh, condenser or battery to be short. Um, and indeed, you have some power that you can harvest. So it's not a lot, but we thought that it was quite interesting. And you can see, hopefully, share our uh, passion for that kind of application. And so <clears throat> that brings a little bit of an end to this uh, presentation of what should be the future. And I will uh, dare to ask you really the wrap-up question. So Michel, if you could launch kindly the third uh, survey. Uh, that's really a take-home message <laughs> because we had a goal here and the goal was really to see well can we end uh, you know uh, noise in induced uh, hearing loss on workers and for that my question to you is well what you know is one of the best practice uh, and that has been actually uh, recently recognized by the OSHA NIOSH NHCA alliance uh, and to be included in hearing loss prevention programs so is that the fact that we have this over-the-counter hearing aid act the fact that we now have fit testing for hearing protectors, or the fact that we have indeed a clear roadmap for hearables and the use of digital hearing protectors. And your answer. Well, thank you. So this is really uh, music to my ears, the fact that you answered so much for the hearables and use of digital hearing protectors. So indeed, um, I think what we only have uh, for real is the fact that fit testing is now uh, here. It ha has been adopted. It was uh, promulgated in 2008, so in 2008, 2008 by the OSHA NIOSH NHCA Alliance as being one of the best practice. And that was really the beginning of it. And so now we are more than 10 years after and it's now almost standard practice. So whenever you have all those questions on here, particulars, well, is that good enough, not good? And so on, just think fit testing. That's the answer to most of your questions. That's good for a lot of the motivation, training, <clears throat> liability and so on. So it's, it's fine for this. And indeed, if I'm ever invited, you know, in uh, in five years from now to uh, your nice community, I'd be uh, happy if the new best practice would be indeed to have uh, hearables or digital hearing protectors uh, to prevent and preserve that magnificent uh, sense that we do have. Thank you very much. Okay, so I don't see any questions here yet. So we'll give people a, an opportunity to put some questions into the Q&A pod. 
Uh, we do have a few minutes left. We are scheduled to go until 12.15 Eastern time. So there is time for Jeremy to answer some of your questions. So we'll see what happens. There is a, a comment in the chat pod that came through. Excellent presentation. Thank you very much, Jeremy. Thank you. Okay, so we do have a question here. How can audiologists stay up to date on these developments? <laughs> All right, uh, that's an interesting one. And the, um, there is, um, you know, as researchers, we have to, uh, to publish, you know, this is really the publish or perish uh, game. Uh, on, that's the name of the game, but we, uh, so we do have those uh, out. And I would say that, you know, in, uh, in practice, um, we do uh, with the group that I'm leading and colleagues uh, in uh, hero conservation. And I'm thinking, for example, uh, the Quebec Health and Safety Research Institute, ERSST, that is, supporting a lot of our research projects as well. Uh, for example, one uh, coming up that is uh, the merge of hearing protection and hearing aids. And this is maybe a question you have often, you know, people that come to you, to your practice, asking, well, I need to be protected because it's louder there, but I'm not there uh, retired. Uh, so I need to be uh, working, but I do have that hearing aid. So what is your advice? Shall I remove the uh, hearing aid, put earplugs? Shall I keep the hearing aid, but put earmuffs on top? Shall I take the hearing aid, but turn it off? what is the exactly the answer and this is you know something that is not very clear and actually not clear at all so we did with SST a, a larger survey on all the practices that were uh, there you know around the world around the audiologist and we are now uh, researching on you know what is a good approach and how we could we make uh, hearables, uh, you know, merging uh, hearing protection and hearing aid? So, for example, what I'm saying to you is that Quebec Health and Safety Research Institute would have those reports be available in the public domain. Uh, so that's ERSST. Uh, we can maybe uh, type that in the in the chat. I'll do that. But the um, the idea is that you have those uh, reports that are really made, you know, for practitioners in the field. So that's that's uh, one answer. If you don't read to don't want to read the uh, the published material, which might be a little bit uh, dry indeed. So that's my answer. And the second one is that, you know, I'm uh, welcome. Well, I always welcome any, any questions you may have and would be happy to, to redirect you to uh, any resources we may have. Great, thank you. So the next question here we have, how much amplification is possible? Moderate high frequency loss? Um, so, uh, Dev Cooper would like to answer this question live. <laughs> so <laughs> the, um, I guess the question was uh, how much for the products that we saw, the consumer products. Uh, and indeed those products are being launched uh, currently mostly as we said, as uh, consumer uh, products for listening to your uh, music, uh, having a phone call, a video call and so on. And now they are featuring more and more those, um, they call that assistive uh, listening uh, features. And because of their nature, you understand that they are not sealed. So they have, uh, they are shallow fit. So they will have limited gains. Uh, so they would be definitely going for the uh, entry uh, level. So the, the, you know, slight to moderate hearing loss, they can know that they don't provide a sufficient seal to go for, for deep uh, or higher uh, hearing loss. Uh, that's almost for sure, but be careful. They are very, very, very uh, smart. And, uh, you know, as powerful as uh, any of your hearing aid, the DSP. So if you look really at what those uh, companies are able to do in terms of uh, processing the signal, uh, putting the anti cancellation, uh, avoiding the hiss or the feedback and so on, they are, you know, as good in terms of capabilities as uh, any of your uh, hearing aid or any of the hearing aid chip. Okay, the next question here, could you please review the ambient and medical monitoring section? Uh, I'm not sure where that came from. Uh, yeah, if that person could just slightly give me a, a hint to cue, I, I'm, I'm not clear what the, the end Okay, is. we'll Thank leave you. that for now. Yeah, yeah. Um, how soon do you think the hearing aid industry will be applying this technology? Well, um, <laughs> there is, um, I have, uh, you know, couple of my first students, you know, are in this in this market and in this industry. And I can tell you that they're, they cannot share a lot, but uh, I can tell you that um, there are definitely a lot of, uh, of efforts that are being currently done. I think um, the, those um, big companies have been slowed down by the fact that that 
hearing an act was not clearly that's an act, but then it has to be passed as a, whatever law or made into the regulation and how you interpret that, how the EPA will do its interpretation and so on was that, that still open. So this is why it took so long. But once that will be out, uh, things will go very fast. And I know that there are a lot of companies that are in the starting block uh, ready to launch. And, uh, you know, I can name, name one, for example, that is um, with their permission, you know, the, uh, you know, Bose, for example, for their active noise control, this excellent, you know, earmuffs for, you know, being on the plane and uh, protected from your ambient noise, or if you're a fighter and a pilot, uh, helicopter pilot, you may use their products as well for pro uh, communication systems. Uh, but, you know, uh, wouldn't be surprised if uh, after their first attempts at what they call the earphones, some of you might have seen that uh, headset that had uh, really that neck band this is why i'm doing that sign had a neck band and uh, had those two earpieces so you've seen it for the sport version maybe but there was one version only launched in the united states that was doing a very very good uh, hearing aid feature and it has actually uh, been able to mimic uh, uh, hearing aid fitting uh, systems with just two knobs that the user would adjust. They were able to achieve uh, what we call the wide dynamic range compression um, with subject as you know using and assessing his own uh, parameters and his own his or her own adaptation. So this is really something that uh, was successful in terms of, uh, of proof of concept. And uh, you know, guess uh, guess what? They had on that uh, earphone product. They had actually already directional mic, so you could really beam form and focus on something that would be in front of you or more omnidirectional and so on. So this is the type of capabilities that people have. So don't be surprised if you see you know hearing it coming up, uh, coming soon out of those uh, those labs. No no surprise. You wouldn't be surprised after my talk. I think shouldn't be. <sighs> What would the cost for these electronic hearing protectors? Uh, so the the protectors that uh, are manufactured by ears, um, I, I I don't have that uh, exact uh, you know answer. I, I don't know that. Um, uh, you know, I think the prior version used to be in the. Uh, pre uh, pre launch version pre product as we call them were in the bulk park of you know 500 uh, bucks um, that's you know the price this is the price that you've seen for a lot of those uh, consumer products as well that I've I've shown or the earphones from Bose I was just uh, referring to I don't know if this is something that comes from their market studies or what but it seems that it's a, a little bit of the the price but that's only the product. Now, if you have all the features of monitoring your workforces and having uh, that, you know, holistic approach, uh, it comes with a price tag as well. But I have, I'm sorry, absolutely no idea. Okay, so the next question. Uh, when counseling people with hearing loss about protecting their hearing, what kind of information could be given? Yeah. Are there resources suitable for individual clients or for organizations which may not be covered by industrial hearing conservation programs? Yeah, indeed. So that's a very good question. I think I already answered partially to that, saying that it was such a question that we had from uh, the audiology, uh, well, from the, you know, um, from the practitioners you know in the field that are facing that uh, difficulty that we actually uh, designed that research uh, study uh, with colleagues from university d'ottawa and from university of montreal to uh, to really look at all the references that are available and that report is out and there's actually a, a peer-reviewed paper on it as well so again i'll be putting that uh, in the chat or maybe uh, michelle we can i can point you exactly to the resources and have them online but this is available but currently, the short answer is that there is no uh, universal answer. And our belief, uh, just to say it uh, quickly, uh, we are afraid that uh, currently a lot of hearing aids, when they are used in the industry, in moderate uh, environments, uh, they actually make things worse. Because you know that in moderate uh, noises, those hearing aids would tend to uh, amplify and risk the risk of suddenly making that ambient noise be dangerous for the ear at least in terms of uh, continuous uh, exposure so this is one of the uh, one of the view we have one of the angle and we'd like to really be able to monitor because we have that in-ear technology monitoring uh, capability we'd like to really monitor what uh, is achieved by those modded gains and how we could find you know better fitting uh, profile let's say or um, prescription uh, for those uh, those hearing aids that's one and the um, yeah, and the second one is really to to look into uh, uh, combined um, 
um, algorithm that will be able to both amplify and protect. So it's really into uh, you know, speech enhancement, uh, noise suppression, and, and the like. OK, so how can audiology be involved in hearables? Sounds like we will be out of the loop. Occupational health and safety personnel would be doing this? Well, I, I think that's, uh, you know, it's very good that you ask yourself the question because, you know, I think that, uh, you know, hearing aid dispensers will, you know, uh, I don't know how they, they are currently, uh, you know, revisiting their positions, but it will be certainly something that would be very uh, disturbing for them to have those, uh, those uh, hearables, you know, uh, really uh, in their own market and on their own turf. So that's, that's known uh, and some people are prepared for that. But, uh, you know, I think there is definitely a, a room for audiologists and people that would do that uh, counseling approach and that training on actually, you know, what are the hearable uh, market? What are the solutions? Uh, how can you really tune them to your own need and so on? So I think uh, it's actually will be almost uh, become a new um, yeah, line of service that maybe some audiologists throughout Canada will be able to offer. Um, and, you know, there will be a time where consumers will stop, you know, paying uh, those, uh, those crazy prices for uh, hearing aids when they realize that they do have the same electronic and capability uh, for a tenth of the price, uh, but need maybe some guidance or some uh, adjustments. Okay. Uh, have you studied people with middle ear conditions like non-intact eardr eardrums? And how do the conditions affect the monitors in the ears? Yeah, uh, so that, um, that's a good question, but no, we uh, indeed, for, for the sake of our research, we do limit ourselves a little bit to uh, normal hearing people and audio autologically normal uh, subjects. Um, and so we don't have those conditions, so I don't know. And But the reason we do that is really that we believe that, you know, we should first uh, protect and we should really develop new technologies to better protect the ear so that we don't have, you know, uh, damage, uh, damage cochlea. As for our middle ear conditions, this is certainly something in between, uh, but we don't study that, unfortunately. Okay. What about workers who use hearing aids who are working in industry? Yeah. So I think we covered that already, saying okay. that there is no clear answer yet, but I'll put the, the link to the report that summarized that. Perfect. You can send me all those links to yeah. afterwards, Jeremy, and I okay, can cool. put that up on our website and I can email the participants that are on our call today. Thank you. Um, Safe listening is a priority topic in the World Hearing Organize or the World Health Organization World Hearing Report. Have you been working with the WHO? Have you been involved in other policy initiatives about preventing hearing loss internationally or in Canada? Oh, yep. So sorry, I was on mute. The short answer to that is uh, yes, 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 and yes. So I've, I'm part of the uh, Make Listening Safe uh, initiative launched by the World Health Organization um, in Geneva, and I attend those uh, those meetings. Um, I do have there uh, a couple of the students I mentioned. I think uh, are there, but representing their their companies as well. And th this uh, idea to so the, the the underlying assumption is that we should really. Uh, make sure that uh, you know the devices that we do have you know in our pockets are not making that uh, younger generation uh, deaf and to do that we need to really address the issues of you know listening uh, to music you know in those uh, commutes in your uh, in your room in your whatever uh, study time and um, how can you make sure that this is indeed not too loud or if that's uh, loud that this is not too long because you understand that those is the combination between the duration you're listening to something and the level you're listening at. So the hope is that we could really have precise those uh, assessment uh, systems. And the most precise one is that if you have that microphone inside the ear, as I mentioned, but you cannot always uh, have wearable or uh, you know, consumer products with a microphone inside the ear. So sometimes you have to look at simply what we call the electroacoustic gains and how you can uh, uh, adjust those gains and limit the levels of exposure uh, to those, uh, those, those young um, younger generation at least. So this is something that is very important for me, very close to my, uh, my heart. Um, we as well, <clears throat> I'm an associate professor at the uh, McGill University at the Schulich uh, School of Music. And uh, we launched uh, back from a uh, Geneva meeting. I you know, decided to really launch that educational uh, and awareness uh, program um, using uh, what we 
sometimes called the Jolene Mankin. So that was an initiative from the NHA, National Human Conservation Association, to have a, a mankin, so dummy head, inexpensive one, but that could accurately measure the levels you do get from your uh, MP3 players. And in order for the uh, listeners to really understand how, we know where they're listening too loud or, or not. And on that um, idea, for example, I developed uh, or proposed a metric uh, that I call the age of your ears. And so let me just take two minutes of this or one minute. We don't have much time, but you understand that we are all aging. The ear is aging. Presbycusis is, is affecting us all. We know exactly how this uh, happens with age. On the other side, we know what noise inducing loss uh, um, triggers or involves in terms of loss of hearing. And what I did is simply a match between that loss of hearing due to noise and the one due to age. And matching the two, you can actually put uh, have equivalent numbers. And rather than saying, OK, you've been exposed to 92 dBA, or you have a dose of 107%, or you have a TWA of data, which means nothing for, let's say, a, a young uh, you know, a student in the music faculty. What you can do is tell them, well, you're currently uh, 22. In three years, you'll be uh, 25. But if you keep listening at that level, your ears won't be 25. They will be 30 in three years, meaning that your ears are aging faster than your body. And uh, if you want to listen to how ears at age of 30 are uh, you know, perceiving sounds, and we already have that presbycusy or things, Here's a musical play where can, you can see the effect. So that's a little bit, you know, the kind of idea and, and work we are doing. Not to mention that I'm on board of the uh, CSA standard. I mentioned the Z94.2, uh, the American National Standard, the, the S12 uh, committee, and the ISO committee, the working group uh, 17 on hearing protection devices. So, um, you know, I think there is a, a lot of momentum, you know, uh, changing a paradigm. I think the fit test was, you know, a good success. I think we, we need to, uh, to know uh, to do a second win. So that's where I stand. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you very much, Jeremy. Uh, we seem to be at, our, at the end of our time for today. So I'd really like to take the opportunity to thank you, Jeremy, for sharing your expertise. And I would like to thank you all for participating today. We hope you enjoyed it. Uh, don't forget to register for the other six webinar in, webinars in this series and details are available on the SEC website. So when I close off the meeting today, a survey will pop up on the screen when you exit. Please take the time to complete it. So that's all we have for today. Have a great day and bye for now.